Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and in the company of these two very fine and important galleries uh, who have collectively done so much to support the cause of art design and craft over, uh, over the years. And uh, like uh, Patty, I'd like to also thank uh, the uh, hosts here at Heller and Doug and Katja have become uh, particularly good friends since my move here to New York, as have so many of the rest of you here in the room. I've now been at the Museum of Arts and Design for one year and one month. Uh, and uh, it, it, does, it does seems in some ways like longer than that, in some ways like I've just arrived. So it's been uh, fantastic to be welcomed to the city so warmly. Uh, it's a real pleasure tonight to be talking with you, Kiff. Uh, and I should say that we have not rehearsed or prepared for this in any way uh, out of ideological belief that the less prepared we are, the more interesting the conversation may prove to be because we might surprise each other. Mm -hmm. um, so we've never met. We, this is our first meeting, indeed. Uh, so you're going to see that our relationship take shape before you. Um, so um, without further ado, I'd like to turn to you, Tiff, and, and just have you explain a little bit about this body of work and a couple of the ideas in it. I have some ideas that I might want to ask you about, but first, can you just give us a sense of, um, of how you came to this body of work and what it represents for you in terms of your overall career path? I would say that the one abiding reference in all of my work is the importance of the hand, and, and the mind in the hand, the eye in the hand, and respect for the hand. So I have focused on that in various ways over many years. And perhaps the, the other acknowledgement I wanted to do with this work was my acknowledgement to jewelry produced by so-called non-industrial societies throughout the world through or ethnic jewelry and <clears throat> they were that work were my early teachers really and uh, so in some way I wanted to acknowledge that in some ways uh, I wanted to acknowledge the ancestors. And I was thinking about in recent travels that you, we often see jewelry in, in sites as offerings, you know, to accompany people in the afterlife, or it survives from various cultures because, for various reasons, but jewelry are certainly jewelry is certainly an indicator of culture as well. And that has been more my interest all along. And uh, I was wondering what happened to that energy to uh, honor the <coughs> ancestors. Then it occurred to me maybe it's museums, <laughs> that that's where that happens in what we offer to the ancestors. But anyway, uh, I came across these um, stone points, Neolithic points, through a good friend of mine who is an ethnographic art dealer and um, a colleague of his had these points and he called, uh, my friend called to say that they were there and would I be interested in them. And I couldn't go that day that he was visiting, but I said yes, I definitely would be. I had been thinking a lot about um, technology and materials and how jewelry has evolved in different ways over the years. People who are working with jewelry as artists and uh, my technology uh, is very low tech. It's very rooted in making by hand. And, <clears throat> and also the materials I use, as many of you know, are, are often already used. And I feel like there's so much stuff in the world already I like. Uh, being able to reuse some things that are 
left over or discarded, and using their, uh, their associations for, for, for the purpose. <clears throat> At the same time, you know, there's often a lot of confusion about uh, found materials and what that's about. I remember that Marcel Duchamp said that um, too much, if you use them too often, you have to be careful. Uh, he would advise very limited use of found materials because they are so loaded to begin with. But it's part of that loadedness that I'm interested in as well. And certainly with arrowheads and stone points, they have <laughs> what uh, their associations. But to me, it was interesting. They set me off because they are, the stone is really the oldest material around. And in a way, I was, this is all really my a kind of reflection on, on technology and materials. And I wanted to see if I could bring these stones uh, back to life in some other way. Mm -hmm. And when I first saw them, some of them were so intricate and so fine, it was very moving to realize that uh, you couldn't help but think that the maker was, it was going so well that it didn't need <laughs> to, to be that fine, but there was something else that was happening that was that that might be saved, what he had made, he or she had made. And so I like seeing the, the functional edge and the aesthetic edge crossover. And um, so there were, that's way too long an answer. Well, that's, that's okay. <laughs> because there's a lot to talk about. I think we can spend the rest of the time talking about things that you just said. Um, and a lot of things were prompted in my mind, as I'm sure all of yours, as Kip was talking. Um, one of the things that I think we must talk about is the concept of the tool, mm -hmm. because that lies right at the heart of this body of work. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously not a new subject for you, but one that's very, very strongly stated here. Mm -hmm. And of course, one thing about the stone points is that they are themselves tools. Exactly. Although, from another point of view, they are evidence. So an archeolog archeologist or an anthropologist or a historian would see them as a kind of data. That's about right. a certain culture. Um, but then, as you rightly say, they are also the evidence, um, not just of culture, but of a specific individual's attempt to perfect a form. Mm -hmm. And I was really glad that you started out, Kif, by talking about the importance of the hand mm -hmm. and what the hand imparts to an object and to the environment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is the core value of the museum that I direct as well, the Museum of Arts and Design, having been founded as a craft museum, um, although we still have a uh, although we now have a broader range of um, exhibitions than just craft per se, we still believe in the power of craftsmanship, workmanship to infuse the environment with some kind of humanity. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the, the idea that you had about inhabiting the mind of the person who had made one of these stone points and imagining that sort of risky, thrilling moment when you're almost done and you still want to shave just a little bit off, mm -hmm. maybe risking breaking the whole thing and spoiling all your work. That's obviously a very um, moving thing for one uh, craftsperson to feel about another, you know, millennia later, perhaps, or hundreds of years, thousands of years later. So um, I have one simple question first. When you were working with the stone points, did you have any kind of hesitancy about using objects that were that charged and had that much evidence of another maker's mentality and workmanship? Did you, did part of you want to just leave them alone? Uh, yes, and I would say I have dealt with these issues for now 30 years. Mm -hmm. Because any, any found object presents that same problem. As it does, yeah. in a certain way, but mm -hmm. these two more particularly as artifacts. Yeah. But at the same time, 
uh, we as humans have traded and exchanged and moved materials around yeah. always. And, um, and But yes, it gave me a lot of pause. I also had pause when uh, a body of work I did with um, photographs, mm -hmm. cutting into photographs. and. Which were How bad earlier we, this year, of course, in the, this exhibition called Multiple Exposures that we did about right. photography and jewelry. Exactly. Sorry for the product placement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't uh, connect that too, but anyway. But, but because photographs have their own specificity and they can be quite precious in their own right. Well, exactly. Yeah. And of course, with jewelry, there's always the association with the preciousness and how that's measured. And jewelry is almost stuck with that more than maybe other areas. But um, I like that for the first time, I could, in fact, be working with precious stones. It's, it's, it's <laughs> but a different kind of precious stone, right? Right. Not diamond or sapphire, but rather something very ancient and anthropologically right. significant. And part of their part of their preciousness is their history and mm -hmm. what they indicate. And, um, and as I felt with some of the photographs, you know, sometimes people were taken aback that I would cut into these things. And, but they had been long abandoned <coughs> in, uh, and somewhere along the line. And that their value was when the identity of the people in the photographs was lost, that was the end of their value, so to speak, yeah. um, <clears throat> as you know, more not as formal artists' work mm -hmm. that these photographs were. And these, um, there are many museums in the world that have many arrowheads that we never see. And in a way, again, I felt like bringing that to the fore mm -hmm. again. And as a tool, the other thing I had to get over was that these were killing tools. Yes. I mean, these were fashioned for killing, and that, but that was necessary for survival. And, um, you know, one point about the um, profusion of these things in museum collections that has prompted to mind for me is that uh, this necklace, for example, which is made entirely of these stone points, it's called Turning Points, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a great title. It's a sort of pinwheel mm -hmm. of these arrowheads, um, almost as if you're catching them in flight still. Mm -hmm. um, I was just thinking when you said that about the difference between hundreds or thousands of arrowheads sitting in drawers in a museum collection and being used as scientific evidence, as we were saying earlier, right. and how different it is to have these actually around your neck mm -hmm. and wearing an object mm -hmm. like this, because in the one case, you have many, many people who go to that museum who have a very weak relationship to each of those arrowheads, whereas here you have one person who has a very intimate relationship to these particular arrowheads. And it's almost like you're bringing them back to the scale of the single human mm -hmm. instead of leaving them in this general anthropological That's a wonderful point, actually. System. Uh-huh. Yeah. Putting it in that way. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I feel like... Um, that's one thing that artists who work with found objects can do, because found objects, even if you think about Duchamp's uh, urinal or bottle rack or shovel, you know, those are in some ways very anonymous objects. Mm -hmm. you know, they are objects that were actually made mm -hmm. by somebody somewhere, but we don't know who those people were. We don't know where that urinal is from, whether it was from a home, whether it was from a store. And what Duchamp was able to do by appropriating mm -hmm that object is actually give it some kind of specificity again. Exactly. So, so th there's something there about, um, yeah, about finding value in the found and, and making it personal again. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Another thing that I wanted to ask you. Um, what does that mean to you by saying making it personal again? Yeah. I'd like to understand what that means from your perspective as a mm -hmm. curator, scholar, um, I think it's good that you're asking questions too, by the way. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I think for one thing, it's a matter of making it expressive. Uh -huh. Because okay. I think with the, again, to think about the arrowheads in the museum, 
I think there's a pretense of objectivity uh -huh. when a museum, even an art museum like ours, mm -hmm. has a pretense of objectivity with regard to the objects that we find mm -hmm. and collect. Mm -hmm. Whereas an artist, or also somebody who buys work for an artist and then uses it, mm -hmm. um, or even hangs it on the wall, um, there's, I think, a sense of individual choice and subjectivity mm -hmm. that happens there that a museum curator, generally speaking, isn't allowed right. or shouldn't exercise. I mean, in some ways, you could say that a museum curator who operates only from taste uh -huh. or only from instinct is not really doing their job. Right. You know, taste and instinct may have a big part to play, but there also needs to be argument. There needs to be a right. kind of um, objective measure. Mm -hmm. Uh, and comprehensiveness, otherwise the curator's value doesn't quite, um, the, 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 otherwise the curator's not really performing a public service exactly. in the way that they exactly. should be. Whereas the public service provided by the artist is completely the opposite. It is subjective, it is personal, it is willful mm -hmm. in that way that a curator's isn't usually. Mm -hmm. So um, the, that w does relate to a question that I wanted to ask you, which is about the tool in relation to the found object. Mm -hmm. Because another thing that I was thinking about with regard to this work is that on the one hand you have the found object, which is the thing that you operate on, so this thing that's already out there that you're going to work in mm -hmm. some way. And then you have the tool, which is the thing that you work with. Mm -hmm. So I was imagining your workbench with all of your tools, your hammers and saws and whatever else you have, mm -hmm. rasps. And it seems to me like the work falls somewhere in between, and it almost it's almost like this, it's almost like you're connecting the dots between the thing that you're working on, the raw material, and the tool, which is what you're working with. And I wondered, uh, so I wanted to ask you about using the tool as an image, mm -hmm. as well as using the tool, really using the tool, to make the image. See what I mean? Well, in a sense, that's another found object, yeah. is the familiarity, the, re the representation of mm -hmm. something. And sometimes I find that I approach things when I'm trying to discover myself what I'm getting at, that I will make a, a more literal representation of something, which I actually did here, and I realize now that I've often done that, but that I did with the divider in the sense that I made it, even though it doesn't operate as a divider, but the points, which are the stone points, the rest of the construction is very representational of an actual tool. Mm -hmm. So, but I like when there's a kind of tension between what is going on, mm -hmm. and between what might at first seem recognizable and familiar, or what you think of as a tool, mm -hmm. and um, then the context is everything. Mm -hmm. Can we look at one piece in particular? Mm -hmm. This is one that particularly captured my attention mm -hmm. this way. I'm just going to pick it up. Uh -huh. So this is the, the piece called um, Abalone Shucker, mm -hmm. which is a great title. It sounds kind of like a band, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure what genre they would play. but um, So you have this beautiful confluence of um, materials. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, one of the stone points. I gather this is an abalone shell. Is that right? That's right. And then you've uh, back binded it with metal work, mm -hmm. including these kind of staples on the mm -hmm. back. Um, and what I thought found really captivating about this object was that it made me think about a t some tool called an abalone shucker, which I also hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is new. That's the thing that you put into the world. And I was wondering, first of all, whether you actually had seen an abalone shucker and was making something, <laughs> or whether it was more of a poetic idea about working with this raw material, this living thing that's really going to be hollowed out, possibly eaten, and mm -hmm. then preserved as raw material. So could you just talk a little bit about the thought process of this particular piece? It's more, more the point part of it, because all of these have other cutting references. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's taking the, the, the killing part of the tool into an, another reference to a point as a marker or Actually, one time, I remember uh, a cousin of Rod's was shucking oysters, and uh, he cut himself, and, and uh, 
No, he said, this is really tricky and this is really hard, and he's a surgeon. Oh. And that affected me, seeing that he made that mistake. And, um, but anyway, uh, that was abalone, not an oyster show, but I just clicked in with the idea of, of you know, a pointed tool and becoming more abstract with the reference. So you're also thinking about a latent violence that's in these objects, yeah? Well, in that case, that was there. there. And, and so what happens, because this is a, this can be worn mm -hmm. as a brooch, yeah? It's a pendant. Or a pendant, mm -hmm. yeah. So when it's on the body, mm -hmm. what happens to the object for you that seems different to how it is on the table? It's a big difference. Yeah. Because one thing that, uh, that I realize I've done and intend all these years, and these are all parts of a whole. So they have a different life as an individual. But they, uh, because that's why I always want to show it in an exhibition sense, because um, I've never been attracted to the masterpiece idea or the single piece summing up everything. That's just um, the weight of that was maybe too much. And also, I just find I think in these layered ways. And um, so these are, are parts of a whole. And it's also related to ownership and how I think of uh, this. <coughs> Many people who are actually interested in the work can't afford to buy the work, yeah. but they can have the work by seeing it. I mean, I don't have the things that have have thrilled me in my life with art. And so... You've seen them in museums, probably, right. mostly. That's, yes. that's, of course, the wonderful thing about museums is that it's a form of collective ownership exactly. in the culture, which I think is the most important thing that we provide, in a exactly. way. It's that sense of encounter without ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the sense that you are part of this. I mean, yes. a bunch of people will own this piece. But th there was something um, you made me think of in, in relation to the group of work, mm -hmm. which is that in some ways it's like the, the whole body of work is like a poem. Mm -hmm. And when somebody takes one piece away from the poem, it's like they're taking the line they like best from the poem. Mm -hmm. It's almost like if you, have a, if you know a poem really well, maybe you can memorize one line like, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Probably, if any of you can do the rest of that sonnet, I'll be really impressed. But that's, that's the one we know, and we take it away with us. But of course, we know, and even when we take it away and memorize it and recite it, that it belongs to this larger whole, and that its meaning takes its shape in relation to that larger whole. Exactly. And, and I feel like one of these objects might be, therefore, like one line of a poem that you kind of take away with you, but you know it had another larger world that it was a part of. Thank you for thinking that. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I think that in many ways, I accidentally happened onto jewelry as uh, what I could do since I was not a writer. Oh, really? That I couldn't write a poem. And, but these are very connected with language as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, they're very rebus-like, but mm -hmm. that's something that's always been true of your work, Kiff, and that is, in fact, another thing I wanted to ask you about, because your way of composing, and again, this would be a good example, mm -hmm. is very associative, mm -hmm. and since we've already talked about Duchamp, I'll just mention another idea of his, which is the idea of the assisted ready-made, mm -hmm. where he takes a found object and maybe pairs it with another found exactly. object. The one I'm thinking of particularly is the one that's a white cage, mm -hmm. like a little bird cage, right. and then it's filled with um, little cubes of marble that look like sugar cubes, and exactly. then there's, I think, an abalone shell uh -huh. inside it, isn't there? Uh -huh. There's some kind of shell uh -huh. inside. And it's just these three things that are brought together. Mm -hmm. He hasn't actually made anything with his hands, but the conjunction of them has that poetic, associative, maybe surrealist quality. And that's very much in my roots as well. <coughs> surrealism and the juxtaposition, what happens <coughs> when yeah. These are put together, or and it has a lot to do with um, 
having jewelry be the form that these take. Because mm -hmm. even though most of what I make is very wearable, I'm not necessarily talking about the body or what, in that sense. I mean, it's much more what happens in the hand or close up. And so, but that you particularly <laughs> pick that one. Uh, there are some things that just come together and without uh, the same purposefulness as some of the others. And that one just came that way, almost by accident. And it's, um, you have to trust that too. And uh, it's like being a good gardener. You have a plant and you have a garden. And you never really confuse the two <laughs> because, you know, things happen yeah. along the way. Although this is one of the deepest and most important things about craftsmanship, is that um, the seemingly effortless poetic thing happens precisely because you are so prepared exactly. for it to happen. It's, it's a little bit like that cliche, you make your own luck. Mm -hmm. And I always think a, a great artist puts themselves in the way of a happy accident. Right. And not only does it happen, but they also notice it when it happens. Mm -hmm. Because somebody that did not have your aesthetic preparation, mm -hmm. putting those objects together would not have realized that they had made something magical. Right. So it's also a matter of long, long exposure to the possibilities of your trade and your, and your art. It and, is, mm -hmm. exactly. Chance favors the prepared mind. So um, another thing that I did want to ask you about, Kif, was the concept of ritual. And I know this is something that's been deeply important to you throughout uh -huh. your career. And that, of course, goes back to the question of encounter with um, other cultures. Uh -huh. um, and I often think that um, what other cultures do strikes us as ritual, but what we do, we don't necessarily recognize as easily as ritual. Right. Um, we think of it as perhaps habit uh -huh. or just um, culture or even something is, that seems to us quite logical. Mm -hmm. But when you encounter a culture that's quite different to your own, um, things start to seem mysterious mm -hmm. and to have a kind of pageantry and a kind of magic in the everyday mm -hmm. that we need to remind ourselves to be uh, to notice in our own lives. Exactly. And it seems to me like one um, one of the effects of your work is to perhaps bring some of that magic and mystery from that anthropological context, mm -hmm. that other context, into our own lives. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk um, about ritual, your mm -hmm. ideas of ritual, and also maybe a little bit about specific cultures that might have, might have been in your head when working on, on this body of jewelry, if that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, I didn't grow up with much ritual or with much tradition of anything, and certainly no reference to ancestors or no religious rituals uh, growing up. And. Um, there were certain uh, seasonal rituals that I thought about later that uh, that's maybe the reason I fastened on those things that you did, you know, you put the storm windows on in oh, the yeah. fall, these kinds of things. Yeah. So that there, but anyway, I think what you're referring to other cultures, uh, there are so many things to balance too from what do, what in fact were these other cultures that I was attracted to or the jewelry from other cultures when I didn't come from there myself and um, not necessarily just that it was exotic, you know, that what is communicated. And I suppose in a certain way <coughs> the stone points are universal to human culture. And I guess in our world now of becoming so separate, more and more separate in every way. And uh, I was thinking about um, you know, these, these Neolithic points, their form are the same 
basically wherever humans lived. Hence the title, mm -hmm. so points of origin. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in a jewelry sense, when I sometimes wonder why on earth I'm making a jewelry and what does that serve and um, I look at Africa Adorned, which is a wonderful book about African jewelry, and then I'm restored. Mm -hmm. So my kind of ancestors in that sense with jewelry are also connected to Africa. So I think this there was a kind of ritual in making this work, but also connecting um, it becomes more and more layered the longer you work and the longer you live. So the bowls are made with the paper where I have also worked many years. And, but it's um, as an offering. And in a way, I think of artists as there is a generosity to artists yeah. that. Um, Can I just interrupt yes. you? Yes. Because um, I think there's an important thing here about the work, which is that it is not primitivist. Right. And this is so subtle, and I, I'm not quite sure how you achieved it even, so I really want to dig into it a little bit. Because I think one of the dangers that you're steering towards is this idea that you're working with some kind of primordial cultural context. Exactly. Which is universal and kind of foundational and simple. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you think about that in relation to Africa, for example, that comes worryingly close to this idea that there you have an undeveloped culture that's right. pre-civilized and we stand in a historical relation to it. Um, and obviously we wouldn't want to go there. You mm -hmm. know, that's all, like the way Picasso treated African masks, for example. Exactly. And he, of course he treated them with great genius, mm -hmm. but he also, I think, indulged in a kind of primitivizing stereotype mm -hmm. and there's been, many, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of that. And I feel that your work doesn't do that doesn't have that primitivizing relationship mm -hmm. to the content, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not exactly sure how you managed it. So, <laughs> so I, I want to ask you about that. I guess because I don't feel that it's primitive in that sense. Uh -huh. And my idea, I mean, I think Calder had a way yes. of of working. I, in a way, I wish I could, you know, the actual look of the work. We're more primitive, but I can't help it. I'm stuck with this way of refining things. But I also, in this case, like that tension between When you say you wish it looked more primitive, do you mean that it were more well, basic somehow? I, no, <laughs> I appreciate the energy of imperfection. But of course, Calder was totally in control. and But he he considered everything on the same plane, mm -hmm. jewelry and a monumental uh, sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I do too. Mm -hmm. I just think that the, the scale is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the dangers that you're talking about, of course, I'm mm -hmm. well aware of and have thought a lot about those things. And it is only when I feel that I can come to it honestly with what I'm trying to do. You know, when I think about many of the great uh, post-war American jewelers, so mm -hmm. Art Smith or Ramona Solberg, mm -hmm. who you have a particular association with, I know, or Fred Wool, mm -hmm. um, who used found objects. Mm -hmm. um, Art Smith didn't use objects so much, but certainly Wool and Solberg did. You see a very strong tradition there of mm -hmm. artists who are skirting right up to that line of the primitive without ever uh, getting involved in any kind of stereotype or cliche. Right. And I, I feel like it's very important for those of us who are scholars and historians and curators in this field, as well as artists and gallerists, to point out where we have been successful, where other fields perhaps haven't. Mm -hmm. And I would say that one of the really strong um, accomplishments of post-war American jewelry in particular has been that kind of use of the found object, mm -hmm. which is extremely subtle and nuanced and sophisticated in relation to the associations that are thrown up by the object mm -hmm. without ever becoming cartoonish. Mm -hmm. And it, it does have that kind of sly sideways mm -hmm. movement that we were talking about with relation to the 
abalone shucker. And I, I myself feel like that's one of the great achievements mm -hmm. of that field. And I guess that, that prompts the question, what about jewelry as a medium? It helps you do that. What about jewelry um, makes it such an effective way of dealing with found objects as a material? Is it, does it have something to do with its connection to the body? Is it scale? Is it intimacy? For me, it is scale and intimacy. Um, but also, of course, now I'm associated with found objects which I don't use all the time, or yeah. that isn't my my purpose. The ones you're wearing, for example. Yes, don't for have example. Found objects. And but these kind of folded into the, this work. This is from 20 years ago. And I had a very simple drawing in my sketchbook that was a line drawing of this one. And so I, I made it just to see what that was. But I saw it at that time as um, scissors, as an outline of scissors. And, uh, but I, it didn't, I feel like I could make simple, beautiful things very easily. But that's not what I want to do. No, I'm. That's not what I can. How I can contribute something huh. further, because it isn't as a product. And, and not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just not my. Um, it's more poetic that I'm interested. In. So what I did with once I made this. I liked it because it was so utterly simple, but it didn't feel like I'd earned that yet. So I made four other pieces that got progressively smaller, and the smaller they got, the more detail they got. My tendency is to elaborate <laughs> and add. Typical but, jeweler. <laughs> uh -huh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And um, so in a funny way, these pieces came around again to, uh, and, and now I have a, another plan for them finally, but that's... Mm. Do you think that there's a way that um, jewelry, precisely because it is an ornamental and sometimes marginal medium, mm -hmm. gives you permission to tackle things that might actually be too daunting to tackle in a more... Um, Authorial fine art medium because the, a lot of the things that we've been talking about are pretty big, like mm -hmm. human condition, you know, yes. other cultures in general, ritual in general. And I feel like, in some ways, jewelry has this modesty that allows yeah. it, to, it's almost like you're kind of sneaking around the back of this gigantic building and coming in the servant's entrance, mm -hmm. and suddenly there you are in the middle of it, and it's like nobody really noticed how you got there. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's something. There's something that, for me, jewelry and other craft media allow that, that sort of sly, observational. Right, and that's effort. what I'm using. I mean, my most valuable tools are limitations. Limitations mm. technically, and the limitations of people's preconceptions of jewelry. Yeah. And so I like to use that mm. for unexpected mm. occurrences. Whether that's on the body, in the hand, laying on the table, and it's partly that in in smallness can be something big and something, or at least um, you know, trick your curiosity. And, um, though certainly, sort of aesthetic, formal. Concerns are there too. You know, that's sort of built in, or that to be the carrier of these ideas, you you have to get them surely and make them sure of themselves. And that's, that's a great. That's so well said. Um, I, there's a lot of you here, uh, and I'm sure you all have questions. We won't get to you all, but um, does anybody have anything they're um, interested to ask Kef about? Yes. Uh, did you ever break any arrowhead, and how, how did you handle the broken pieces if you did, if one broke well while working with it? Mm -hmm. 
um, I actually discovered that some of them had been repaired. And, uh, but, you know, repair is not something I feel bad about. And, uh, well, I did a whole show about repair. And uh, so, if I could, I <laughs> rejoined them. And, uh, and then there was that kind of, again, there was that kind of tension of stone being hard and strong, but at the same time, you drop a piece of jade in just the right way, and it breaks. So, or people thinking of paper as being fragile, and when in fact it, it can be very strong. So I like working with those contradictions, definitely, too. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about the toolbox? Uh, well, I don't know if it would be to maybe tell you the hardest part was how to make it one piece. So this was, <clears throat> and then to use an already made toolbox. Um, again, I had to feel like I earned using this box. And uh, it's because in this case, I felt the, these tools all did come together to, to be one thing by being in the box. And so I had thought of trying to do that, but I didn't know whether I would make the box, and I happened on to this. Where is it from? I don't. And it's a beautifully made box. And um, so by lining in, inside with the paper, made a kind of, sort of formalized the inside, but I also liked that these pieces were on a bed, beds of paper that I had been working with in Oaxaca that were made there. And the tools, as I worked with the tools, they took on different layers as some uh, is this too much? To no, no, go ahead. Um, some actually use parts of other tools, or uh, I mean, this uh, one has a spindle whirl, which was an early tool in weaving, and so I made it, suggesting the spindle whirl, but it isn't really either because. Uh, and, and some of these used materials, I'm quoting myself from previous materials that I've used. So this point on here is not stone, it's coral that I painted. And some years ago, I had a show with Kay Sekimachi, and we made things that we found on the beach. And so this piece I used here because it fit with the idea. And um, in some pieces, like this one, I of the scissors, I wanted to draw attention again to the edge of the stone. So that is part of why I made it in, in that way. Um, referring to the artifact part of things, this one, which as a reference to like garden shears or cutting shears, but the artifact part is in the in the rusted can lid that I found on the street. That, um, and also the name of these, <laughs> the reference to these shears is refers to a particular kind that has a straight edge and curved edge. Well, that's just layers that I think about. It's not necessary <laughs> to know all this. But I, this was a way I could keep the tools together and are, are close to the basic tools that I use also. You know, this, this reminds me a little bit, Kiff, of the, um, the early Cabinet of Curiosities, uh -huh. where you would go to some collector's house and then they would 
take things out of drawers and show them to you and say, oh, this is a normal, normal mm -hmm. horn or, you know, this is a relic that belongs to the same as so-and-so. And there's something about the way that you're able to give us a tour uh -huh. through the object. It's like you created your own cabinet of curiosity. That's very there. much a reference also. Um, are there other questions for Kip? Kip, I, I just wanted to, one of the questions that I asked Kip um, when she was first putting out the work was, um, which, how did she decide which tools ended up in the toolbox? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And on the table, as opposed to on the table, and she said, the tools that were in the toolbox were the ones that, you said, I think, that the ones you would use. Well, they have a reference. They have a reference to have your own passed through my use in some way. Right. Sometimes humorously like the, you know, the folding knife, but then, the, then there's the spoon and, you know, those knives that have every conceivable Swiss art, art knives, yeah. which auto easily just think is the most horrible thing ever invented, which I also was thinking about make, in making that anyway. Um, and they aren't all tools. I mean, these <clears throat> are more, uh, you know, in many of the grave sites, they found um, flowers and pollen that, that, that allowed them to date things. So flowers were given an offering, and I was originally thinking of putting them in the bowls, but that is their reference to the bigger picture of all this. I think, back to your question, Glenn, is that I guess I want a, there to be a wider view for jewelry, and, and that maybe eventually that will accrue to it because of people working with it in different ways. It has a lot farther to go, don't you think, with other, I do. compared to other? Um, I don't know about compared to, I think actually that um, there's a lot to be proud of. Oh yeah. Actually. Oh no, I, definitely. I, 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 when I look at the collections at MAD, for example, I don't feel a sense that um, I wish I worked at a museum with lots of paint and sculpture. Uh -huh. I, I feel much more um, inclined to point out that so much was achieved by so few. Yes, uh, that I agree. I didn't mean that. I meant more in people's perceptions oh, yes. of what would be considered. Well, that, that would be our job, I guess, at the museum. <laughs> Not <laughs> right. just us, obviously, lots yeah. of people, the galleries as well. But I think that um, I think we have a lot of um, work still to do to overcome people's mm -hmm. um, perceptions that some fields are naturally set to be intellectual and others are naturally set to be mm -hmm. ornamental. And I, th I think that, although probably most people don't think that consciously anymore, mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot of um, work to do in that way, mm -hmm. but slowly but surely. But ornament so often was connected well, to exactly, meaning, exactly. <laughs> you know, and uh, I guess, uh, and many people have said to me, well, why don't you make sculpture? Like, that's higher than jewelry, yeah. or better than jewelry. Or grown up or something. Exactly. Yeah. And it's uh, the exact reason why I stay in jewelry. <laughs> to demonstrate the value and the yeah. possibility maybe. for creating. Uh -huh. yeah. um, maybe you can take one or two last yeah, questions. It is 6 o'clock, I know. But. Questions? I'm sure everybody would like to take one more look at the work and maybe speak to Kip and then. So thank you very, very much. This was a